our show. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Welcome to The Large Glass. My name is Todd. I'm Terry. And this is our weekly show where we bring you a new artist live to talk to. And the usual suspects are showing up in the chat already. Mm -hmm. Hi, everybody. Nice to see all of you. Hello. We got Ben. Hi, Ben. Nice to see you. And Mom and Dave and John and Pumpkin Audrey. Pumpkin Audrey, shout out to you today. Yeah. You totally came through for us and we really appreciate yes, that so did. many many thanks for the cream of chicken soup was delicious Yum. and let's see we got joseph barbaccia is in the chat for the first time welcome to the show thanks for coming Hello. and checking it out uh make sure to follow us which should be fun because we got a lot of great stuff coming up in the future um hi hi how's it going it's going all right we're gonna mix a cocktail tonight we are yeah yes so i'm excited about that i am too i'm so, excited for the little cocktail cam we got cocktail cam tonight which is exciting and it's not something we always have but i'm hoping that we have cocktail cam more hi boo jazz nice to see you um so we talked to our artist we did about what we should drink mm -hmm. what'd she say well she offered the suggestion of a mixed drink yeah and it's kind of cool because we typically don't do this sometimes we just go with beer wine There's nothing wrong with beer but and wine tonight but tonight we're, we're going to be drink. doing an old-fashioned that's right which we're excited about yes. so um i'm going to start to mix that all right yeah that should we go to, you want to go to cocktail cam uh we can go to cocktail cam. cocktail cam so i have got some really fantastic ingredients for tonight's um old-fashioned first of all I was told that you absolutely cannot go with the cheap standard issue uh, maraschino cherry, that you absolutely have to go with this um, Starlino Italian made uh, maraschino cherry, which is just fantastic. So um, we're going to be using those. Um, and we also have, let's see, we've got these lovely giant spherical ice cubes they which i am so such beautiful. a fan of now we don't put these in right away but you can check those out those are beautiful so i'm going to get on making this right now there is a tiny dot of bourbon in the bottom of your glass that's because pam had a drink straight up yeah we had a little toast <laughs> so that was right. kind of nice so we start out with a little bit of sugar, and it's usually a sugar cube, to be clear, but I was unable to obtain sugar cubes, so I apologize about that. And then I'm gonna put this to the back here. And then we're gonna take that dot of sugar, and we're just gonna saturate that with a little bit of aromatic bitters, okay? So we let that kind of actually dissolve. We're gonna help that along with a little bit of a mix. All right, a little bit of a mix. Very nice. And of course, it's focusing on my hand, but now you can see it. Great. And now for the addition of this beautiful, wow. rather large block of ice. Now, if it were just the sugar cube, you still mix it and dissolve it and all that what stuff? What you would do is you'd saturate it with the bitters onto the sugar cube, which would cause it to dissolve, and you would give it a little bit of a mix. Okay. So then we're going to eyeball the shot. And I've got to do that in yours, too. Ooh. So let's get that going. Let's get a little bit of this in there. Let's get that ice cube in there. Now, I wanted to talk to you guys about something while I'm making these that we find to be rather exciting. We are engaging in a design of a new pin. A new enamel pin is coming to the large glass. Some of you probably remember, oh, ho, ho, ho. look at that. That's a thing of beauty. Uh, some of you probably remember the first pin that we had done, which was the beer stein or a beer mug. A lot of you have won that already. Um, it's very nice. But we are now embarking on a new series of pins. Let's tear off a little bit of orange peel here. And then I'm just going to get a couple of slices of this. The new pins are going to be alphabetic. And the alphabetic pins are going to start with A. 
And then the glass design that's underneath the A will be the appropriate drink. So A is for nothing other than absinthe. So we've got an absinthe glass coming to town. It's beautiful. It it'll be beautiful. done in about a month mm -hmm. and it'll be here on the show. And then in celebration of that absinthe, we are actually going to make an absinthe based drink and give away a pin on that show. You'll also be able to win the absinthe pin. Then we'll move to B. B is for Bloody Mary. C is for, I don't know, but you guys are actually gonna vote on that stuff. So we're excited about that. Let's see, we got Carolyn Thau is here. We got Jess Park is here. So we're excited about that. Here is Ooh, your old fashioned. So you can just pretty. give it a little swirly swirl. Swirly swirl. Look at that. It's a gorgeous thing of beauty. You might catch me eating a couple of the maraschino cherries along the way. Cheers, episode Cheers. 76. 76. And we're excited about Pam Glick tonight. We are. Cheers, everyone. Let us know Cheers. what you're drinking in the chat. Carolyn Thau has champagne. Oh, nice. This might have needed a touch more sugar. But I love this. This is really something. Yeah, you're going to be hammered in a little while. <laughs> I'm going to be hammered. Night, night, Terry. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll see you soon. Yes. All right. So, so. should we uh, start to maybe talk a little bit about who we're having on the show tonight? I did have a few. Oh, one more quick thing for everybody. Um, first of all, in support of our show, if you could support our show, because I go into this little thing every week. Um, if you're here and you're a first time viewer, make sure to leave a follow on whatever venue you're, follow you're viewing us on, whether that's YouTube, Facebook, or Twitch. Um, that's first and foremost. Second, you can always go to our website, which I'm going to put a link to down below us right now. And if you go to our website, you can hit the support button. That's at thelargeglass.org. And you can find a number of ways to support our show. We work very hard at doing this. We're hoping that we're doing something important for the world. And uh, hopefully you could um, do that with us. And I'm noticing that we've got somebody in our Zoom chat and I'm sending them a little message because they need to move over to Twitch. Yes. Um, I don't know if you can hear me right now, Pam, but Carla Knight is in the oh. room. I don't know if maybe you could either send her a message or text her and see if she could pop over to the Twitch channel, but I put something in the chat there. So anyway, support us if you can. We would love that. And uh, let's see, what do we've got? Uh, Joseph Barbacci is having Sauvignon Blanc, Ooh. which I know will appeal to Pumpkin Audrey, yes. who's probably also having a Sauvignon Blanc. Yep. Carolyn Thau says a champagne pin for C. That's a good one. The vote is in. I like that. Uh, John Park says, oh, it will be mine one way or another. My first one is on my army jacket. Nice. Awesome. Love that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, OK. Why don't you start to introduce tonight's artist, please? I would love to introduce would. tonight's artist. We actually spoke about Pam before. We fell in love with her last summer. Yes, we did. When she had a show out. And she's one of the artists that we invited to look at the show later on. And she liked it. And then we figured, let's ask her to come on. And she said yes. So we're going to have her tonight. And we are thrilled. Yeah, I'm excited about that. Yeah, so if you know about Pam, she comes from Buffalo, New York. She received a BFA from RISD and an MFA from the University of Buffalo. He's a little bit biased. Um, her work is in several private and public collections. Most recently, the Journal Gallery in New York. Uh, this past summer, she also exhibited at the James Barron Art in Connecticut. White Columns Gallery, Ober Gallery, UB, Anderson Gallery, a number of galleries, Bundy Modern, Gallery 68 in Berlin, and on and on. She's been featured in numerous publications. We are thrilled tonight to have one of our favorite artists, Pam Glick. I got to raise the curtain on Pam Glick. I'm focused here on getting our people from the participant. Hi, Pam. How's it going? Great. <laughs> having me we are so thrilled to have you on the show we like, like terry's build up to introducing you doesn't even begin to talk about all the conversation we've had all week in anticipation of you coming on so we're super excited about that thanks i'm excited i wish we were all really together but this is this is good enough for right now i would definitely like that as well mm -hmm. um and hopefully at some point can you imagine if we had like a big studio with couches and a bar and oh, we could all mix cocktails sweet. at the bar yeah. and then sit down and have yeah. the conversation we can have one of those recessed 70s lounge 
rooms what where was, everybody Were they hangs called out. the conversation pit? Something like that. What was that called when you had that deep recess in your living room that everybody sat around in a square? Was that like a conversation pit or a Possibly. It was kind of a know. cool thing. Yeah. Um, anyway, that has anyway. nothing to do with what we're talking about tonight. How's it going? Oh, it's great. So I'm all good technically. I the, I've unmuted. Yeah, yeah, you you sound great. You look great. Oh, we love great. we love your great. setting. Everything looks really good. Thank you. So, well, well, where to begin? Where we have our begin? cocktails. By the way, Pam, cheers to you. Cheers. Um, love to just do another toast on camera because it's so good to have you. So, cheers. Welcome to episode seventy six. Yeah, you guys too for making it all happen. It's great. Excellent. I feel bad because Carla's still hanging out in the Zoom partic uh, the the waiting room. So, um, I mean, it's it is what it is. I hope. I, and, and she's one of my dearest painter friends, a wildly talented gal. Um, we just have no tech skills. We're painters, so we're just well, you know, kind of in the in the shadows of the world these days. <laughs> gotcha. Well, I could. Let me let her in and tell her. Should we tell her on the show? That would be embarrassing. I don't want to do that to her. Tell her what? Tell her that she can go get this other link and get over there. Oh, yeah. 63 is here. Cheers to Pam from Joseph Barbaccia. Yeah. Uh, we got a lot of stuff coming into the chat. Yep. By the way, chat room, if you're new here, we encourage you to use the chat, ask questions, and we will relay them uh, to Pam. And she can, you know, we'll try to get to them as quickly as we can. But And it always doesn't work out as best as we wanted to but we will try yep. so um oh, should tell carla to go to twitch tv twitch tv forward slash todd lambrix i put the if she looks in the chat room for the zoom it's in there look and, uh... oh she went she must have found it so she's gone okay yeah it's end up in the right place i don't know we'll find out we'll find out we'll find out yeah i don't know if we should put her on the spot that might not be nice let's talk about your painting Yes. Let's yeah. talk about let's talk about your work. Let's let's yeah, let's just talk about painting. I mean, painters are alone all day thinking about painting. And then we kind of wait till someone maybe writes about painting. But it still is fun to try to talk about painting, even though it's a visual, clearly a visual language. Yeah. So I love talking about painting with anybody. And you know, Obviously, we do, too, and that's one of the reasons we started this. And we also felt like, you know, in some of the interviews we've sort of come across with you, we got the feeling that you liked talking about painting. We also loved talking to you this weekend when we got together for the preliminary. Yeah. So we're like, this is going to be a good chat. Yeah. So, yeah, good. Excellent. Okay, let's go. Let's go. Let's go. So your studio, you don't, um, where's your studio at? You don't have to tell us the address or anything like that, but can you describe it a little bit for us? I mean, it's uh it's eight minutes from my house it's on main street in buffalo it's in a old factory building where they used to make um like the original i think model t fords mm -hmm. then they made airplane parts during the second world war you know it's like a huge an entire block of a, a converted factory building, mixed use. I'm on the fifth floor, which actually in Buffalo is is tall. Buffalo, even though it's a city, it doesn't have a lot of, there's a downtown area, but the Tri-Main building, which is where I am, is, um, you know, the tallest thing. So I have a sweeping view of looking west and south, and I can see hawks and pigeons oh, and all kinds of you know, I'm always looking at birds for some reason. They just catch my eye all the time. So I have a, uh, maybe it's 1800 square foot studio with, you know, big windows on the Western wall. Yeah, so this photo is, um, those are three by five foot paintings just to give a scale of, you know, what, we're looking at mm -hmm. and um you know there's a loading dock there's it's just a great building i feel so so very lucky to have gotten a studio there and um 
you know, I go there every day. I just like, I'm so lucky and happy that I can go there every day. It's like my temple of painting there. Um, so you sound like you're ready to say something. I'm sorry. I don't want to keep interrupting. You didn't interrupt. I didn't? <laughs> <laughs> when, when, so usually when we talk to artists, we ask them like, what's a typical day like for you? Do you get up fairly early and just hit the studio yeah. first thing and then come home towards the end of the day? I think or? it's a, I think for us, that question is about this notion of ritual. Like what yes. are your rituals? Like what is it that is required what to music sort of do you get it going? To? You know, like this, these are the types of questions that I, I feel are really interesting when we get into someone's practice. Well, I read about the music that you do listen to. So I'm curious to see what you're going to say. Yeah. Um, I get up super early. I would get up ordinarily at like 6 30 or 7 but my dog Annie likes to wake up at like 5 30 and so I usually just obey her and she's a mix of a hound and a shepherd and so we go downstairs everyone else is still sleeping I feed her and make tea and um well I'll get dressed before all that and then I take her for a walk in the neighborhood. Like, I think it's one mile, one way. So it's like a two mile walk. We pretty much do every day. She's 13. So she's getting a little creaky. Oh. Yeah. But, uh, I mean, even though we're in the city proper, Buffalo just has like beautiful neighborhoods and walks and, um, uh, Frederick Law Olmsted, who designed Central Park, of course, yeah. designed Buffalo, mm. the, the city of Buffalo. So there's all kinds of parkways with uh, circles and leading to this massive park called Delaware Park, which is my, in the summer, I go to my studio on my bike and I c can commute through the park. Mm. So it's very special. It's kind of like a, a glorious little bubble that I live in actually. And, um, and then I just stay there pretty much until like anywhere between three and six o'clock, depending on how things are going and what I'm doing. My, um, to go into just a tiny bit of how I work these days, um, the kind of paint that I use once I put uh, you know, do like a painting session. It takes about 45 minutes to an hour to dry. Oh, there's someone in the waiting room. Yep. I'm working on them. Don't worry. Um, and so while, while that stuff, while that thing is drying, like I have, I'm working on other things, work on paper or, you know, different paintings that studio is so large that I, can work on several big paintings at once. So there's, um, I, I really like the way you talk about place. Like when you just described the walk to your space, when you described the physical space itself, we know that there's a connection to places like Niagara Falls. You're talking about windows, spatiality, the birds that you look at. I think there's a real, I, I, I like to talk about that in relation to what we're seeing in the imagery, but how does, the world around you, the physical space around you play into what you're painting? Is it a direct relationship? Is it an indirect relationship? Um, I think because, I mean, it sounds kind of cliche to say like, I look at trees or I look at plants. Mm -hmm. I love to garden. That's like a, I'd say I'm a like mid-level hobby gardener. Um, I am like, all in on dahlias it's not the time of year to really talk about them but yeah but let's do that because it's nice to talk about them <laughs> yeah but, um, you know it's like i basically can't sit still so my relaxation is like coming home and like doing some other incredibly <laughs> complex uh, physical activity um but, you know, I go online and I, I live, my mom lives with me and my two sons right now because of COVID, everyone's ended up together. Sure. And um, so we go online and like pick out new dahlias for the next season. And 
But dahlias, I don't know if you know this, it's like there's so many great things about that flower, but m massive variety and what they all look like. And you dig up the tubers in the fall. Mm -hmm. So if you plant one tuber, you'll have about six in the fall. Mm -hmm. So oh, wow. it multiplies like a potato. And um, so kind of like how things grow, how things work like all the connections and the tubers, like, I guess I'm just always looking at stuff like that and leaves and plants and plant life. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, Niagara Falls is a very early, very overt um, influence. It's 20 yeah. minutes from our house. So I always take everyone there if there's time to go visit it. Yeah, well, we were looking at some, um, you were mentioning in the letter, in the newsletter today, yes. about the fact that Niagara Falls has a live uh, cam. So yeah. you can go look at Niagara Falls anytime you want to. Mm -hmm. And so we- In real time. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, that and so cool. we jumped on to look at it just in preparation for tonight. And we noticed that there's this, there's this constant forming and reforming yes. of shape and mist and and yeah. um uh like small waves and repetition yeah. and line and line is constantly changing and it totally yeah. makes sense um but i want to jump into the chat real quick because there's some people popping in here that are saying things to you and i definitely want to make sure we get to it but uh joseph barbaccia says something about uh getting creaky i can identify when you were talking about the dog uh, let's see, we've got Julie Fleischman is here. She says, hi, Pam. Um, hi. Our viewer number 63, he says, and by the way, we don't numerically order our viewers. That just happens to be his username. Um, but he says, sorry, I missed Pam's explanation. What type of paint is she using these days if she's willing to share? And does she find that the paint affects the painting's style? That's, I guess, a, a two-part question. Well, it's... I'd say yes to that, but it's the other way around. The painting style is what affects what kind of paint I use. So um, I use golden acrylic, mm. and sometimes I use a little bit of flash because mm. I like the pigments, mm. but I use a lot of like this high-level Benjamin Moore interior house paint, which is a, a water-based enamel. And the thing about this paint store here, I'm sure you can do this lots of places, but I mix up colors from flash or from acrylic, and then I can get a gallon of liquid, a liquid version of that, because I like liquid paint. I like I don't like the static like blob of paint that you squeeze out onto a palette. I like kind of having to wrestle with it a little bit that it's kind of hard to control. It's a little more organic and more um, like I'm like, it's another, like I'm not the only one painting in the room, like the paint itself kind of does its own thing. So it's kind of like doing it together. I don't know. I've never said that out loud, but I've kind of. I love that. Yeah. About it. But like with the palette, with like the spots of paint, I love the color and I like mixing, but I don't like the static paint. And I, I can really say that right now, like this painting that you have up right now, Parts of that were made with um, the liquid, with the enamel paint. We'll just call it enamel paint because um, that's, you know, it's a big can of enamel paint. Um, parts of this, this is a, an earlier painting, earlier meaning like since I've been back in Buffalo, I've been back here eight years, but this is probably six, six years old, I think. That went to white columns, I'm not sure. That was in 2017. I think that was in the white column show. That was in 2017. Gotcha. So that's got spray paint, enamel. It, that has everything. I can see pretty much every kind of material in there. 
Yeah, Joseph Barbaccia just asked, as you said, that he said, are we seeing spray paint? And I was wondering the same thing, yeah. but you just answered that. And 63, who asked the first question, says, nice, love when folks use house paints, very Twombly, um, which, you know, I think actually kind of has a little bit of relation. There's kind of like this 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 written yeah. element to some yeah. degree, like the almost like the glyph Characters, yeah. present. Um, you know, I love that about the liquid paint in such a way that it relates to all these other forces of nature that we're yes. talking about too, yeah. because there's yeah. this control, lack of control. Right. There's a connection, especially with Niagara Falls, when it's such a force and the paint seems to have similar properties. Exactly. Yeah, but mm -hmm. I, I also love what Pam said about not being the only painter in the room, that mm -hmm. the paint itself is the other painter. Yes. I, I, that is that is such a beautiful thing. And it, it, it really lends to, I, I think when you say that, when we're looking at this painting, I need no further, like, I'm not going to use the word explanation because I'm not a fan of that word, but I feel like that completes the painting for me. Mm -hmm. That that kind of puts the punctuation mark on it to some degree. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So, uh, so let me see. I had a couple of other things that you, you had said a lot there, and it made me think of a couple of things in there. Um, I mean, I know on this show we tend to talk a lot about you know technique and materials and those things and i know there's a curiosity around that um but can we talk a little bit about your paintings sizes and then we're going to get into mark making a little bit but i know that a lot of these are really rather large yeah, correct? and also i mean some of them are stretched but are quite a few of them unstretched as well or some of them just on canvas no i would say i went through a phase of making these there's a canvas uh, oh, what's it called? Uh, Buffalo. I'm sorry. It, it's like, it's a canvas store, but it's for buying canvases to cover your boats or cover like a baseball, oh, yeah. that kind of thing. So it's like, it's tarps, what we would call tarps, you know, as painters mm -hmm. or, you know, like the kind of tarps you would rake your leaves onto. Mm -hmm. So I went there for a while because, oh, it was very inexpensive. You could get large surfaces. And I had them put grommets in them all around the outside mm -hmm. to so the edges weren't getting frayed. Quite frankly, collectors don't really like those things. They're always <laughs> like, oh, well, can we get this framed? Or what well, can we uh, stretch this on stretchers? Mm -hmm. And, you know, mm, there's one like on the wall behind that other one. Yep, it's sort of just a sliver. Are, but, you know, there's there's a, a certain feel to that kind of work. And and I think if that was like your, the kind of work that you always did, but I, you know, more than not use stretch canvases with, you know, corners and edges mm -hmm. so um it just like it just became impractical because they they're hard to you know i hang them up on like nails and things i like them but i'm not really in the phase right now of even wanting to use them and what i figured out is like my work is pretty rough it has like a rough kind of feel to it like the mark making or I don't know, there's like a roughness to the way they look. So I think that it really serves the painting better to have as formal and elegant a presentation. So it kind of like they work against each other, but work with each other in the end. Mm -hmm. So, so that would have been a reason to get away from the grommets and the, uh, the, the more utilitarian exactly. approach, right? Like I like one of my favorite things is driving around Buffalo and you'll in the summer, everyone, you know, a lot of people get their houses painted and you'll see painters putting like how they make those big splotches at first and then paint over the whole thing. Mm -hmm. I guess they're like fixing parts or priming certain parts, but right. like I love that. I mm -hmm. just like to me that looks like the most gorgeous painting in the world. I'm always taking pictures of those things. Ah. And so that to me is like um, just very beautiful. 
And, but that is on like a formal, beautiful house, like a piece of architecture. But what's interesting about that, again, in relationship to some of these forces of nature is those marks that are made, those white marks that are made on that house, are, yeah. those are priming areas of the house that either have rotted or been repaired and need yeah. that prime. So what happens is they scrape the paint down to the wood and that might happen in some spots and not others due to things like the weather. And so that's that is entirely indirectly and directly based on the weather, which is right. really interesting in how you're attracted to that. Yeah, yeah, it's random. And I like things to look like I really like my paintings to look like sort of like they just happened or like that you found it someplace and you don't know really what what century or what how it happened to come about you know kind of to have it look as natural as possible yeah and there's a, there's actually a couple of questions popping in that relate to this point uh mike raider asks he says even when the work seems more painterly it leans heavy into drawing is it formed in drawing or does pam draw with paint I like that question a lot, actually. I love the designation between those two things. Yeah, that that's a, a really classical topic. And like um, a painter I admire a lot, Amy Silman, talks about that all the time, that there's drawers and painters. Mm -hmm. And I have definitely been called, oh, oh you're a drawer. So I'm a drawer. Um, so I guess you could go through the list of modernists or abstract expressionists or minimalists, like who's a drawer, who's a painter. I would be in the drawer section. Yeah. So I draw with paint, but, um, you know, it's, it seems like it's a funny, like kind of a limited way of describing what you do because to me what drawing is is like more thinking like drawing is more equated to thinking and painting is more connected to oh i want to say decorating but i don't really mean that because that sounds so pejorative uh -huh. but it yeah you know painting is more let's say color Right. Well, I was going to inject a word there for you, and I hope I'm not stepping on toes. Or, but I feel like I love the notion that drawing is thinking. It's actually a, an element that I talk about a lot. Painting to me seems more about planning. You know, there's there's a preconceived plan that takes place with a painting, whereas a drawing, there's an immediacy to. Does that maybe resolve that? I don't know. Mm. It might not. I mean, it might complicate it. I bet to differ. Just it's just a language thing because. Yeah. To me, planning, like I think of architects, and that's, of course, drawing. Um, painting seems like it's so luxurious, like it's like color and, you know, uh, quantity, like larger spaces. Mm -hmm. Like drawing is more like obviously linear yeah. and doesn't not this much space. There's a whole bunch of stuff coming in the chat right now. And I think the chat room is clarifying this for us. So let me run through these really quickly because uh, Joseph Barbaccia says, painting is emotion, drawing is thinking. Uh, and 63 says, drawing is line, painting is shape. And I think if we took those two comments and pushed them together, I like the way that kind of works a little bit. I mean, yeah. you think? It's, it's the classic thing of trying to talk about painting, which is a visual thing. So. It's always fun to do it, but it's never, you know, quite exactly what you mean. But like in this image here, on the left side, there's like a very bright fuchsia mm -hmm. and that's paint that's clearly painted, but then there's some spray paint over it, which is like drawing. Mm -hmm. So it's obvious to see what's drawing and what's painting, but why you do each thing is kind of what interests me and um i don't know i think like the marriage of them not the um delineating them is what i'm really going for like how can you make something that is the same like we're drawing and painting are doing the same thing 
Right, mm -hmm. right. And, you know, uh, let's see. So Julie Fleischman comes in and says, I love the sense of urgency of the lines making themselves be seen. Um, Joseph Barbaccia adds, like dancing about architecture. Mm -hmm. And 63 says, good point, Pam, referring back to talking about painting. He says, that's why they call it visual art. Yeah, and I've always had this kind of love-hate relationship with the injecting all the words mm -hmm. and maybe avoiding the experience of seeing the piece. Yes. Right? Yeah. So let's keep rolling on some of these images here. Let me find another one to put up. Um, so I know that we didn't really necessarily put these in any particular order yeah. on the screen because I kind of like the idea of the survey. Yeah, it's fun that they're not in order. Great, great. Um, so let's see, what's what should we talk about next? I've got, I know we've got a few things on the list. Got any um, thoughts? Well, we do have a couple of other, I don't know if you want to scroll through, like maybe one of her more recent studies. Are they we down go, here? They are down there. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. That's some of them right there. Like, should we go here? Uh-huh. Okay. So these are an interesting change up in what you were doing. And um, I, I like this notion of the stripe or the zip. This, and yeah. we can, of course, make the other references to... Yeah the others that have referred to the zip before, but mm -hmm. you pulled this up. Was there something you wanted to ask about this or? Um, well, I thought that this was a good place to start. A lot of your um, paintings are very informed by so many other different artists. I don't think it's, uh, you know, um, intentional sometimes. I think you have a very intuitive style, very improvisational, and you kind of go through, you know, you just start painting it. Um, but, but with Barnett Newman, for yes, example, Barnett like Newman it's here. an interesting thought. Well, and you've, you've been compared to other people, actually some I think that you've even shown with. I think you showed or at least your art was with um, in shows with Basquiat and some people see pairing in some of them and some people see like a variety of different artists and these Barnett Newman. Well, I don't see Barnett Newman in this no, painting, no, but right? Barnett reference. Newman's a very different painter. But right. when we talk about that notion of that line, that mm -hmm. very sort of distinguished line that pushes the rest of the composition back, in, in Barnett Newman's case, it was an attempt to flatten a non-space that he saw space in, if I'm remembering that correctly. Mm -hmm. But there is this kind of other usage here of that really important gesture that he made. So I'm curious, Pam, what caused you to put this in there? Like when you started putting this in, what what drove that decision? Was there something direct or did it just seem intuitive or? No, it wasn't intuitive because I had to use tape and everything to have a really hard edge because um, there's so much organic um, abstraction going on. Mm -hmm. I felt like it was just a way to stop and start and stop and start. So it's just a really, like, I think just really brilliant formal. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> uh, someone in the chat room or something. Gotcha. Um, it's a, um, it's a formal way of dividing the space so that what is kind of rough and organic can be ordered. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So and, well, what I like about that is this, I, I don't want to say it's the notion of a fix or a remedy because that implies there was something wrong to begin with, but it's a pairing like a juxtaposition that kind of, changes the nature of the original thing. Does that make sense? Like Mike Rader just commented, he goes, these knock me out. They traverse through a lot of history, but also look like they were made with an exhale. Mm -hmm. I love Mike, thank you. That's that's yeah. a beautiful thing yeah. to say. Yeah. Yeah, it was, um, it was just a way of, you know, I don't know a, a better way to describe it other than, a formal way of organizing a abstract painting. Mm. Like I love corners, I like edges, and it was just a way of making more corners and more edges. Yeah, yeah. It, it does. 
it does kind of bring almost an architectural component, a divisional component into the space and mm. sort of create a kind of order. Um, yeah. So There's I like, a, the drawing, the drawing and painting, like this painting, for instance, is it's, it's a basically a two color painting, like the, not the zips, but the painting itself is like, let's say orange and black, although there's, a lot of nuances in there. Mm -hmm. In the orange, there's a ton of other color. But let's just say it's orange and black. So the zips were also a way of really contrasting that with blue and a slightly more yellow mm. color. So it was just another like visual device that I felt, I don't know, let's just something I wanted to see how that worked out i don't know it's a spatial thing i'm always working with spatial ideas and like trickery that is spatial that looks like na like nature right. <laughs> painters are just a bunch of tricksters so I, I, it's not like i'm an aborigine and you know don't know what i'm doing i have an instinctive way of working but i also very much appreciate art history. So I'm kind of like, I didn't know at all how to draw when I went to art school and I had no art background and no artists in my family and no one that even had ever heard of art school. So one part of me is like, really like an outsider instinctive artist. The other side is, you know, kind of intellectual and I love to study Cezanne and Pollock and all kinds of other painters that came before me. And so it's kind of a, you know, everyone's just a little bit different and brings a different thing to the table. Oh, and totally. what, what you do with art history is just going to be completely different from what, you know, your friends that are all painters do with art history. I mean, that's what it's there for, too. I'm not sure what happened with that image. Um, that's, that's the way the image was. Is there... That's any... okay. That's like a corner of a, yeah. another painting. It's like, a de it's like a detail in this one, right? Yeah. Is there much planning prior to, like, do you, do you work from sketchbooks? I've seen videos of you actually doing doodle demos and I see you working with, <laughs> with sketches. Fun. It was fun. I love those. I love them too. I actually did one when I was on the phone. I took your oh, That's awesome. Yeah. yeah, that was during COVID and, you know, what, I guess we were all like going back to some weird square one of like reinventing the day. Like, okay, <laughs> what should we do today? And yes. Completely. Completely. Yes. Yeah. Um, when you were just talking a minute ago about spatiality, plus there's a ton in the comments that I want to sort of bring up at some point. But when you were just talking about spatiality, I always got that sense from the way in which you draw with paint and the way the edges interact between figure and ground of this really beautiful vibrational kind of space that to me sort of had this kind of give and take. It had this the places switched in your works. And then with the addition of the zip or say something that seems maybe a little bit more architectural or intentionally spatial, like the one we have up on the screen right now, it, it played with that even more. It didn't negate it. It actually enhanced it on some level. And I found myself really enjoying some of the ways in which those spaces I could move in and out of. Is, is that like, does that sort of work in terms of your thinking in how depth or perception in terms of the the space of the painting works i'm, I'm really mumbling my words Definitely. i mean i think that that would be at the top of my favorite things about being a painter as opposed to a sculptor or making yeah. other kinds of art the two-dimensional like magic that how much space you can create with just the simplest um, tools and marks and whatnot. It's a, it's a huge part of what attracts me to painting every day, like every day. And, um, so these, I would say are, this painting is an, uh, eight foot square. It's just huge to me. It's a like very big, 
uh, painting. I don't work much larger than that usually. And it, um, it's just like a very direct way of playing with those spatial ideas. It, um, it's so interesting and great for me to see this now because this is uh, probably three years old, this painting. And just like what's happened since then is there's just so much here that I had to do that is informing the paintings I'm making now. So, huh. yeah, I think that that just spatial um, concerns and really just like it's such a playful thing to me. The spatiality of painting is to me um, just like the most magical and playful thing, you know, besides color and yeah. when we're abstract artists, you know, we're not talking about where, you know, the all the people are and where the shadow goes on the right side of the tree and all of that. What it yeah. What it means. And yeah, there's a couple of things I just want to rattle off from the chat. Um, so let's see the, uh, sorry, 63. I missed that one about dimension. I, I apologize for that. Um, so oh, Mike Rader did mention boogie woogie Buffalo at one point. And then Joseph Barbaccio says, I see what you did there. I think that was a reference to Mondrian. Um, and just that kind of way in which you sort of uh, divided, yeah, divide. divided uh -huh. your canvas space. Uh, let's see, John Park has an interesting uh, question to ask here. I'm gonna throw it up on the screen so we can see it. But he says, what makes you decide when to constrict or when to make the color palette very expansive? There are works at both ends of the scale. Um, when to constrict. I think you've got some works that are relatively monochromatic or simplified in their color palette. And then there are ones that are really, really involving, you know, like more of a, a full color wheel of, of, uh, of color. Is there, yeah. is there a direct decision in there somewhere or does it just kind of? It's a direct decision. Sometimes if I've made like a, a black and white painting or worked on three black and white paintings for a couple of months. I'll like, oh God, I, you know, really need to make a, a yellow painting or a pink painting. You know, it's kind of in reaction to wanting to do kind of the opposite thing. Right. So, uh, yeah, it, it, there's not a really better answer than just trying to do what I feel like doing. <laughs> I love that. And I think that's absolutely totally well. valid. Uh, let's see, what were some of the other things that popped in? 63 was saying, he was talking about the Zips and Barnett Newman and saying nothing wrong with referencing. Um, there was something else that came up a minute ago that I wanted to reference in some of the, can we just go back earlier? Can we look at some earlier work? Because there's- Where's the ones? Yeah, right. with the uh, these right typography. Yeah, kind of some of the thing. this is yeah. so. How far back is this? Because I love this. So that yeah, that's um. I mean, that was all this stuff is done in Buffalo, so that's an eight year span. Right. Probably seven years ago, six or seven years ago. Um, it's a grid. It's spray paint. It's, uh, you know, has very loose drawing elements, mm -hmm. but, um, but, but then I was doing, um, some quite a lot of, uh, word, you know, using phrases and yes. Cause you have stuff like this text. Yeah. I love that. That actually looks a lot like the paintings I'm doing now, except they don't have words in them. I know. I love this for so many reasons in how it references what you are up to now. And the fact that I got frustrated because I thought I invented sex, but that I saw this <laughs> painting and realized that you did. So. <laughs> Sorry, I, I, I did 
get the I've got a patent pending on it. I, yeah, I, I found that out, actually, but that's good. I'll let that go. Um, but yeah, there's there's this, you know, earlier we mentioned this notion of like the glyph or the letter form or how drawing sort of meets this world of painting. And I feel like this is a really early um, and good explanation of what you're up to now. So I like that as a. Yeah, that's a great example. Actually, I'll just show you. I'll show you one. So I just buy reams of this paper. Can you see this? I can. Yes, the lines with the for penmanship. Um, penmanship paper. That's what I just always put all my notes on, and my doodles that I do when I'm on the phone. I just buy like literally bo giant boxes. So this I invented, I invented sex drawing is like a recreation of a penmanship. Right. Mm -hmm. And when I see grids, I just think of that. And it, it, it's a very, you know, I have a personal anecdote about the penmanship paper, which I'll quick, I don't know if you want to hear like a early anecdote, sure. but so when I was in grammar school, I was an all girls school. I was just always getting in trouble for talking and not, you know, kind of, <laughs> I just was bad. You're, let's you're, just you're say. kidding. You're kidding. And, <laughs> and I, so I, the teacher would give me, like, let me draw during class. Like a couple of them figured out like, oh, well, we can kind of calm her down a little bit. So I had all this penmanship paper ah. and when I got sent to the office, they would give me like piles of this penmanship paper and a red pencil. And so the penmanship paper has been my friend for a long time. So way before I knew the word grid or, you know, a formal things about painting, I was <laughs> very attached to lined paper penmanship paper and i still like as i said it's just like my it's like my little thing i've got like thousands of drawings on penmanship paper at my studio they're all over the place but okay so that actually locks something in for me i'm gonna throw a bunch of references out there that you know i know that sometimes i throw things out there and i can't show pictures of it and so it seems like i'm not talking about anything but i'm gonna do it anyway um if we take penmanship paper, the fact that earlier you said it sounds cliche, but I like to look at trees, the notion of the grid, I think of, and Mondrian for that matter, I think of Agnes Martin. And I love your paintings in relationship to Agnes Martin's paintings. And I'm sorry, I don't have one to put up here right oh, now for the audience. I love her so much. Oh. I love her. It, it, love it makes so much sense now. And for those of you who don't know Agnes Martin's paintings, you can look those up. but. They're very, very subtle, lightweight grids that directly reference nature, but she organizes it and orders it in such a way. And so, Pam, your paintings feel like that to me, right? I feel like that's kind of where these are. These are an evolved version of Agnes Martin's paintings. Maybe that's the word I'm looking for. I like that. Yeah, I, that's a, just such a massive compliment. So thank you. She. Um, I remember when I first saw them and just was absolutely dumbstruck because they were so beautiful, but I didn't understand them. So I, it was uh, other people in the audience maybe are going to remember this, but I want to say they were at Robert Miller. Uh, does been. that make sense to anybody back in the eighties was, uh, I want to say they were on 57th street. Robert Miller. 63 I, I, is saying yes, they were at Robert Miller. He's agreeing. Who said uh, that? Uh, one of our viewers, uh, he calls him, oh. we, we call him 63. Okay, good. Um, anyway, I just remember seeing them as a young artist and being just thunderstruck by what was going on there. So like, uh, to me, they looked like nature and they had this label of minimalism, which so I have this thing about minimalism, which I think it's like, um, like Australian, like Australian Aboriginal art. I don't know how, what, how, what the formal word is, but that kind of 
painting, like automatic painting. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of outsider artists that do repetitive kind of motions, which are like kind of scholastically the opposite of a, of a, um, sorry, I just got interrupted. Um, (laughs) The opposite of a minimalist painter is like an outsider artist, minimalist painters being like, oh, you know, that's some kind of academic thing. Um, I, I really equate them. I really think that there's such a very close bond because maybe it's the simplicity, maybe it's like the confidence there. But I, I find like more minimal abstract artists being abs- being either abstract or or not, but like outsider or academic to be very much like very connected psychically. I, Robert Wyman and uh, Aboriginal artists like uh, or Agnes Martin and polar yeah. Opposites. Mm-hmm. yeah. I love that actually. And I feel like there might be a more genuine sense of the minimal abstraction in a less academic way in the more uninformed world if you think about the way in which it's being done. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Yeah. So I, I somehow fall in that arena where I know what I'm doing but I still have like very simple proclivities. So I kind of try to just let it happen. Yeah. So- and, and you had this fantastic quote that I read that up until recently you said that you, you had a hard time with knowing what you were doing or feeling like you didn't know what you were doing, but you got to a point where you accepted that this is what you do. And, and at that point it became okay. But I think that's a major milestone, a huge yeah. milestone. It is. It is. I guess it's like self-acceptance, which is, you know, painters and non-painters alike, you know, hope to find that. And uh, yeah, it just was a big, a big step for me as a painter to, and and now I just feel like, oh, you know, it's even beyond you know, like, oh, I just love what I do now. I don't question it at, uh, anymore. <laughs> so it's turning into arrogance. So look out. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, let's see. We've got some chat stuff going on. Can you help me read this? Because I'm having, I'm, I'm Which trying one? any of them. I'm just having okay. trouble without well, my glasses Mike on. Well, Mike Rader says, in first grade, we learned to write and are taught to abandon drawing, Pam combined both. And it feels like it formed early, did it? Huh. Huh. I like that. Yeah. Did you catch that, Pam? Yeah, is it a question? I think it is. I think he's asking if the, the to abandon drawing and, and learn to write as two separate things, mm-hmm. um, it, yeah. it feels like it formed early for you. Yeah. I think it still is all the same thing, actually. Like, as soon as I have a pen and I'm writing, like, I went to grad school as, like, a 62-year-old, and I had to take notes and everything. And it just, like, just, like, when I was in seventh grade, there's, like, just drawings all over the thing. And there's, like, a few words that actually will help me write a paper, but a lot of it is you know, just drawing all over it. I don't really see that they're that different because I'm not a writer. I'm not writing. Right. Any- but but writing as a, as a gesture almost seems to play in very nicely to drawing. You know, Pumpkin Audrey's asking a question that goes way back to the beginning of our conversation and I don't think we ever answered it. No. And she wants to know what kind of music you listen to when you're working. Wow. Um, well, I have like a, I'm like a Mozart, pretty much Mozart, mostly Mozart, I'll say. Isn't there like a festival or something that says that? Mostly Mozart? Probably. Um, so I just love him. I feel like it's pre-game, 
kind of music to give you like the most confidence of all time. Like he had to be like the most confident, arrogant guy in the world. Like I just can never believe that some like actual young person wrote that, wrote that music. So having said that, I really listen to just all kinds of stuff, but I love listening to Mozart. Um, like not today, but yesterday I was listening to Japanese monks. It's like I love that. Like Japanese monks in a temple mm -hmm. and it's really fast. It's really fast chanting. Hmm. It's like a rhythm that um, is way faster than you would think would be uh, relaxing <laughs> or like meditative. It's like, very, very, you can just look it up. But anyway, I just thought that was cool. Like sometimes I'll listen to um, older reggae. Um, I think I read somewhere that you like rap. Is that true? Yeah, I love rap. Yeah. I, I lived in New York from 60, from 60, from 1980 to 1995. And rap, I'm pretty sure... I would say was invented from like 70 started in 1978, but 1980, mm -hmm. like it just was being invented all around me. And I just felt so in love with like the kids that were making it and break dancing. They were oh. inventing that on yeah. buses and on the street and everything. Mm -hmm. And when I started having children, we had this, um, did a little cassette of a rap artist named Paris who like, I mean, looking back on it, it's like kind of violent and everything, but we would put that in the car and drive around when our older son was crying as an infant, like it just settled him down because rap has like, it's like a heartbeat. The mm -hmm. rhythm in it is like very, <laughs> that's what I figured like, how on earth would this be settling him down? It's so like violent and everything, but it's like very rhythmic, like a heartbeat. Mm -hmm. Huh, that's a fantastic reference. It I'm, is. I love that connection. And you know, our chat is starting to play games with us now because they know that I'm already like a full old fashioned in and they're giving me tongue twisters to bring to the table. So 63 like makes a reference to Emily Kame Kwanguare, to so say that three times fast, Australian Aboriginal, Aboriginal painter, painter, which is an interesting reference. I'm not yeah. sure if you know who that is. That's 67. And then Glenn Lavertu says, says, I, I think, think that chanting is called Namu Myoho Renge Kyo. Not easy to say or remember. Okay, so you with the pronunciations, that was brilliant. That's Deepak you... Chopra and the Dalai Lama. Oh, that was I feel like I've heard that. I think that's yeah. a mantra. I'm yeah. not sure. But... I think I think it is. You just blew my mind. Usually, yeah, I, mis was... usually I mispronounce everything, but I think <laughs> I think I might be okay on that you one. You didn't fan. That was I love that. Yeah. Thank you. You saved me on that one. There you go. Awesome. Subterranean homesick blues first rap song sixty three. Right. Uh, Joseph Barbaccia says, yes, a mantra. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we, we've got this thing going. Well, Pam, we are hitting the end of our our hour-long conversation wow. here. And I know I told you it goes by fast. It flies. It so, does. It flies. That's so fun. So you can come back for part two and part oh, okay. three. <laughs> <laughs> You know what we'll do is it, hopefully this summer we're going to have an event here out in the country in the woods. We're going to have this beautiful like dinner on the, the big uh, long table outside. We'd love to have you. Yes. And, uh, I'll bring some dahlias when I come. Oh, Ooh. that for the centerpiece. That would be beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. That would be beautiful. Yeah. All right. Well, Pam, thank you. We, we've really enjoyed talking to you. Let's just go through the chat real quick. Everybody's saying such a great, such great work. Great show, Yins. Take care. That's from Mike, Mike Rader. Uh, great session, guys. Thanks so much from 63. John Parks says, love the work. Great conversation. Thanks, Pam, from Joseph Barbaccia. So some of your fans are out there in the audience, and uh, they seem to have a good time. But uh, we really appreciate Thanks, hanging Tori. out. Thanks, Todd. You're welcome. You're Thank welcome. you so much. Yes. We should be thanking yeah. you. So, all right, listen, we will talk to you soon. And uh, take care. Stay warm up there in Buffalo, okay? Yeah, I will. Thank you. All right. We'll talk to you soon. Okay, bye. Bye bye. All right. Let's pop back over here for a couple of seconds. And I love, 
throwing on our closing music. Yeah. It's kind of a nice tune. I don't even know I if it works I keep forgetting anymore. that we have We do. We have, music. we have a nice closing song. Okay. You know, it's kind of like a... It's like, hey, thanks for joining us I can't believe I'm tonight. doing the overbite thing yeah. and everything. At the dance. <laughs> Well, everybody, yes, that was fun. Yes. I really enjoyed that. And again, too. if you're here and you're new to our channel, please follow. We, we love to have people following us. If you do, you get notifications when we're going on. And we have a pretty awesome lineup coming up. We do. You want to tell them about next week? Well, next week. <laughs> I always put that one on you. Next week is going to be pre-recorded because there's something coming up, but we're going to do the Vogels because it's Valentine's Day and they're a great art couple, so that's who we're going to talk about. But after that, we've got a whole bunch of live artists all lined up. We do. So after that, we've got Josh Dorman, painter, coming up, which is going to be fantastic. We're really looking forward to talking to him. And then after that, we have another artist couple, couple. coming up at the very beginning of March, Don Cannell and Lisa Adams. Adler are going to be on and we're booked way out so we I could go on all night about the artists we've got coming up but I promise you they're going to be fantastic you're really going to enjoy talking to them and we've got them live so uh 63 says sing Star Wars Bill Wars? Murray style though <laughs> they're, they're so <laughs> wait Bill Murray style or do you mean well 63 says you got the Bill Murray thing going on. And oh then he God. says, sing Star Wars. See the one that says Star Wars, nothing so, but Star Wars? Well, we'll nothing but. Uh, no, I'm not doing that. <laughs> <laughs> nice try, 63. Anyway, listen, we had fun with you guys today. Thank you so much for hanging out and watching. And uh, we will see you all next week. Now, remember, even though the show is pre recorded next week, I will be broadcasting that from right here. I will be in the chat. And so I would love to hang out with you. So please don't shy away from coming because it's pre recorded. I'll be here. I'm I'll be talking try to, to come you. In. Yeah, you're going to try. try. Yeah. And I'm actually going to have it set up so that if Terry can make it, we could pop on live right beside what's going on. So there'll be two versions of us, the pre-recorded and the live. You can't miss that. We're out of here. All right, people. Thanks so much for hanging out. We love all of you. We will see you next week. Yes. Cheers, Cheers. everybody. <laughs>